Hey YouTube, it's JP Dillon. Today we're going to look at an early 1960s Zenith model L2005-3. I'm guessing this is about a 62 or 63 year all channel provision for UHF, but no UHF. It's a very, very simple set. Metal cabinet, plastic CRT bezel. It's got the typical side controls here from front to back. There's peak picture, also known as sharpness, vertical hold, brightness, and contrast. And I'm hoping that that horrible mark in there is just dirt behind the safety glass and not something more crucial. I picked this up at an estate sale. I don't know its condition. It was cheap. I uh, didn't have any power or anything to test it there, so I really don't know what I'm getting myself into. So we're going to pop the back on it and uh, take a look inside, test the CRT and see if it's meaningful to continue on this thing. Alright, so here it is. Chassis number 14L26. This thing has definitely seen some uh, outdoor action. Got a lot of corrosion and rust on things. Non-stock horizontal output tube. It's got the crumbling yoke of death. It's pretty common of these things. Compactrons. Is that a Compactron? I don't think so, is it? No. Is that a 14 pinner? 12 pinner. So, not a Compactron. I think Compactron's a 14 pin. Another one back there. I might be wrong. 19 CXP4. Is this a rolling tube? Looks like it is. Hopefully that means that it's meaningful to keep going. The rolling tubes usually survive. The later generations do not. There was a tube diagram there, but it's obviously gone. Let's take a look inside the high voltage cage. Probability of there being an original high voltage rectifier. You know, place with original Zenith tube. Probably a 1B3 or 1K3 donut looks pretty good. Only minor cracking there. No signs of carbonization or arc over. That's good. Well, I guess the next thing to do is to uh, get a CRT tester on it and see what that says. All right, so we have the handy dandy Beltron going through the BR3 adapter and then the AE5 adapter with socket sub socket A to use this CRT, and we're going to see if this thing has any sort of meaningful emission. I highly doubt it. Just bring the filament up. Got a glow, that's a good thing. And got some pretty awesome emission there. Cool. That's what I want to see. Nice crisp CRT. Like I said, the rolling ones usually survive. So I'm happy with that. Uh, yeah, that's excellent. Wonder what the life test is on this thing. Let's see. Ten seconds so far. Starts to fall off at 15. That's pretty good. That's a healthy CRT right there, list emission wise. I don't have my fancy tester so I can't check everything else, but so far so good. I'm liking that. So let's get it on a dim bulb tester and disconnect the horizontal out and see what happens. Alright, so whenever I have a set of unknown condition, I'll yank the top cap off the horizontal ladder, I'll pull the tube out altogether, assuming it's not a series trees. Series string, stick a dim bulb tester in series with it. So let's yank the switch and see what happens. Doesn't get that bright, that's good. That's really good. The fact that it's getting so dim though, might suggest that there's no B voltage. 
Yeah, that's like super dim. How much power is this thing supposed to draw? Let's see here. 1.7 amps. So that's what? 220 watts, something like that. The well, bulb's getting brighter again. So maybe we do have B voltage. Yes, no, no sound whatsoever. Of course, with the current limiter on it, it might not be enough to conduct, but you know, that's, that's a 100 watt bulb and that's not very bright. Filaments are lit. Except for the horizontal output, horizontal output's dark. Damper's lit. Other tubes are kind of sort of lit. I do hear a hum from the speaker. Some sort of noise. It's not blowing up. No excess current draw. Let's uh, let it hang out for a minute. That bulb's starting to go a little bit brighter as time goes on, but not much. Alright, so it's been on a while, about 10 minutes. And I hear some slight noise through the speaker, which is controllable with the volume, so something's going on there. The dim bulb has started to settle down. The uh, filter caps are still cool to the touch. And still no activity from the horizontal output. The filament wasn't lighting or anything, but if I come up in here to the top cap, I got 157 volts, so there's B voltage there. That's probably proportionate to uh, the fact that I'm on a current limiter. But yet, when I insert the horizontal output, there's no change in current draw. Well, there we go. That wasn't there before. So maybe I got a uh, dirty socket or something because it wasn't doing squat before. Got a little brighter. So the fact that our B plus isn't going nuts or anything, I don't have any hot smells or anything like that, I think maybe it's time to juice it and see what happens. Alright, everything's in. Let's juice it and see what happens. Vertical. Ooh, look at that. Classic Zenith for you. Tuner doesn't work very well though. That picture's plenty bright. Vertical response is good. Wow. Alright, so it's alive. The volume control is kind of cruddy, but what do you expect? Well, let's get the tuner cleaned up and an antenna attached to it. And uh, there's that classic shutoff there. So coming in here to clean the pots and switches and things, I noticed that somebody did quite a bit of work to this in the past. Uh, a lot of replacement orange drops in here, and a lot of, uh, I think I did see a replacement couplet or two for the uh, vertical integrator. The horizontal phase detector diode's been replaced too, and the vertical size pot uh, has been replaced. So this probably had the failure of the vertical integrators early on, and I think somebody just went down the line and said, let's replace everything in here. Uh, there's this electrolytic here, but it's not getting hot and it still tests great, so I'm not worried about that. This looks like a replacement that was done sometime in the 60s or the 70s, ju judging by the age of the part. And the original voltage doubler would have been mounted behind it in that socket there. 
so that was done uh, pretty cool stuff but anyways we'll just pop it back together I think I'll replace this and this just as kind of a preliminary and then maybe this other bumblebee here just as precautions and then we'll uh, we'll mess with it and see if we can get a good picture on it so just because I got comments the other day about how people like to watch the process of replacing capacitors I personally find it kind of boring but anyways uh, as I had mentioned just a moment ago that I want to change the bumblebees here for sure this guy these are known to explode uh, there's a couple of other firecrackers here that I might change too just because well they like to blow up and I'm not really in the mood for uh, having things blow up on me of course that's assuming that I can find the proper parts that I want all right so anyway the first guy up is uh, the point zero three three and I'm just going to j-hook these things in here so this is pretty simple I'm just going to clip the old one out and this decouples the uh, width control to ground so I'm guessing they use that to prevent some sort of oscillation or waveform from getting into the picture I scrape the leads so that there's a good connection for the solder and then what I'll do is if I have let's say a radio leaded one like this then I'll kind of gauge where I'm gonna have to cut the leads and then make a loop to go around so that's measured about there so I'm gonna cut a little bit further out just enough to make loops you can either j-hook you can loop you can eyelet whatever floats your boat but the point of it is is you want to make a good mechanical connection so that these uh, stay and the solder doesn't get oxidized or corroded so I don't know if you can see that just a little loop there and then I stick it in here that's going to interfere with that part hooray and let me tin this up so that it takes really easy solder on the end of there solder on the end of there that takes that'll make it easier for me to attach it at the other end and I measure just right because there's just looped around the edge of the shaft there solder that in so that's one this other one up here this is a 0.015 um, so yeah the way that we can make that is we can do a 0.01 in parallel with a 0 0.0047 again assuming that I have these things handy and according to this 200 volt device well, anyways, all I have is uh, 630 volt, so no big deal. We'll make it work. So we do our 0.01, which I have here, and our 0 0.0047. So basically, what I do. hard to display this on camera 
but I spray these out on both or on one of them and then I spray it out a little bit on the second one and then what you can do these are hard to hold for me so but I'm just going to twist the leads around one to two turns just enough to get them to hold there like that and then we'll solder these ends Let's see if I can try to get everything in field here it's kind of difficult because the the mounts as far back as it'll go but I'm just going to solder these ends here like this And then we'll trim our excess lead off like this. And now we're ready to install it like we did the other one. So we'll clip this one out. And then we'll measure it real quick. where I think it should go, make our eyelets and install. See, I don't normally like showing this footage because, in my opinion, it's boring. If you guys like it, that's great. Let me know. I'll keep on trying to squeeze more into videos. Otherwise, if it's boring, you can always fast forward through it. Or... I don't have a problem with not filming this. It just eats up space on the camera. And all let's do is one loop there. And again, the purpose of the loop or the J hook or whatever is to make a strong mechanical connection so that if you do have oxidation of your solder crystallization whatever it doesn't completely interrupt the circuit and there's the other one which will solder in there so that's cap number two and let's look at this one here this is a 0.15 I think Nope, another 0.015. Except this one's a, <clears throat> a thousand volt. Now they probably do this because of peak transients. Needs to be able to withstand the pulses, which probably means it's part of the vertical circuit. And that would make sense because it's on the winding of the vertical output transformer here. So, let me see if I have some high voltage caps. I think I do. Okay. .01 KV. Alright. So these don't look much different than the, than the other ones. These say 630 on them, and these say 1 kV, so whatever is that. And then let's see, I had a double lot 47 at 1 kV in here. <laughs> yeah, the box is just off of frame there. same thing stretch them out stretch them out a little bit come on hands work ok 
Okay. Put that there. Solder on it. Look at my fat head, probably. All right. Trim off the excess. Let's go clippy clippy. And then we'll clip this guy out. Again, scrape the leads. And then we'll uh, trim this one back a little bit. Loop this around. This one around. And then we'll put it up in here. Now, if you end up mismeasuring and you got a lot of excess lead, it's entirely up to you, but I trim mine off. I don't like excess lead hanging out. This one I measured a little bit longer than it needed to be. Here we go, moving the camera. Sorry about that. Hold still. And let's solder this side. Okie dokie. Number three, now these decouplings, I believe, are for IF. Um, these are 0.15s. This guy here, this 0 0.0033, uh, is in the horizontal oscillator circuit, which is right here. So I think we're going to change that for reliability reasons. I very rarely ever see these go bad. They look like they were changed out. Um, likewise, this one here was changed out. This was changed out. These were changed out. Somebody kind of gave a, a crap about this set because it looks like they took care of it really well. So, you've got another one over here that's part of the oscillator circuit. That's a 0.047. I think I'll change that out and this out for reliability purposes. I'm more concerned with sweep than I am the rest of this. If the video or IF develops a problem, I mean, we could replace these, but typically in with low voltage, lower voltage, I can't say low voltage, lower voltage stuff like that doesn't go bad all that often. Um, and the set came up with a good raster and clear snow, so I'm not really too concerned about that. I'm just going to change the sweep stuff because it has the higher tendency of failure. So we have one KV and this up here. Six thirty. That one's too big. Let's see, do I need this anymore? Oh, 047? I don't think so. Put that one in front. Another point oh one at uh, 630 volts. Let me go back there. And we have the point oh four seven. So we'll change this guy next. It's time to make another giant digi key or Mauser order. 
I would say on average I probably change about between all the machines I work on about 200 capacitors a day we go through inventory very fast this is this is one of four boxes depending on values voltage type etc and we have to replenish that frequently although we only primarily service hi-fi we do service older table radios portables uh, sometimes older televisions although I I'm kind of straying away from that in the future just because people really don't want to pay the, the shop rate time to have one of those fixed we do a <clears throat> shop rate of about hundred and twenty five dollars an hour here which probably isn't enough given what we have to do a lot of times but it's the old economic thing of if you're too expensive people won't come to you but like I said not much demand for television sets anymore as far as on the repair side of things televisions for me are kind of a hobby these days and I like resurrecting them and making them work some of them I resell to recoup time and losses others I hold on to I have kind of a soft spot for these metal bottom of the line Zenith sets so I usually try to fix them unless they've got a bad CRT or something in which case they just become parts for another set Anyways, I'm ran rambling again. <clears throat> Alright, so that's in there. Let's trim off the excess here and here. And then let's do this guy here, the double lot 33. That's why I pulled those out. Or no, that's. I had the 033 out. Let's put this back. And let's pull out the double lot 33. There we go. So I think this will be enough for dealing with uh, crucial sweep systems. And that cube just popped out of there. And I think out of curiosity, I might test these ones that I'm removing here and see what they're like as far as the value. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know where my actual capacitor tester is at right now because we only moved to this place in June and just non-essential things were not unpacked. So I typically don't go through and test the caps anymore. I just replace them because it takes less time. Man, that person wears very loud heels. The fact that I can hear them walking through the, the wall. Did I scrape this? I don't think I scraped this yet. I found over the years that even if it's working now, if you don't replace critical stuff in the sweep sections, the more hard scrutiny you put the set under, the more it will reveal problems. Okay, so, oh yeah, I forgot to clean these pots up here. That's our contrast. That's our brightness. Yeah, and let's see if I can pull back here. So you can see what's happening. Squirt the contact cleaner on them. Now I'm moving back and forth. I cleaned all the geometry 
stuff back here too so we'll see how that turns out and this has an adjustable width that's tied into the screen for the horizontal output so that's don't see that a whole a whole lot uh, I think we're good can probably put this back together and start dialing it in now as far as um, testing things so when I ran this set initially the electrolytic cans did not get hot whatsoever and if you're wondering why I'm leaving them in here if they don't get hot that means they're not leaky but ESR wise look at this doubler still tests like new that doubler is good and if we come up to the filters here these are like there's a 10 microfarad there's a 20 microfarad another 20 microfarad that one's a little tired of course actually this one could be the 10 and these could be the 220s I just know this is 220s and a 10 uh, and then if we come over here we've got this doubler again tests like new that one's pretty good that one's really good so I don't see a need to, to change out the electrolytics if they were getting hot I would say yes but they're not so I'm just gonna leave them in there and then I'll get the LCR meter and we'll check the little guys down here and see what they actually read out at at this time all right so here's the LCR my old B&K 875 a lot of dust doesn't get used much so I'm just going to check these real quick and see what they actually measure. If they measure like I think they will. Here's a .033. Actually a double lot 33. So that's pretty damn close. That's within 10%. This does not test for leakage, but you can see that that value is still pretty spot on. Trying to get them the leads to stay on here, though. That's another story. This is the .047 I pulled out. We're going to have to go up and scale. 45.5. That's pretty close. Not bad. Here's a point oh three three instead of the double lot thirty three. Let's see what this one looks like. If I can get the leads around it. Might just be something I have to touch on here. Point oh three one six. Let's look at this point oh one five. That one went up a little bit in value. And then another point oh one five. This one at a higher voltage. One doesn't want to read. Let me scrape this away. These Elmacos have a tendency to go boom, that's why I wanted to get it out of here. Not a question of if, it's just a question of when. Let's hold that on there. That's still right on there. So there's only one that really went up in value. Uh, my theory behind the reason why they increase is as they dry out, or as they change, uh, the dielectric shrinks, the foil gets closer together, and they go up in capacitance value. While at the same time, they go down in voltage handling because as the plates get closer together you have a higher tendency of arc over so that's why commonly old capacitors that fail like that will short but that's a a whole nother discussion 
Um, so what I'm going to do now, we'll plug this back in and um, we'll get a signal into it, maybe just a plain old test pattern and see if we can get the geometry and stuff set up so that it has a good looking picture and then um, see where we go from there. Alright, so here it is all back together. Let's see uh, what happens. Singing. Wasn't doing that before. Alright, let's double check some things. Alright, so back underneath again, we're going to check a few things. Since we know it worked before, obviously I made some kind of error. That's where the .047 was. And that goes right to the oscillator. Of course, it could be that this socket is dirty. We'll try cleaning the socket. But just uh, for grins and giggles here, that's 47. I guess I got to pull it off of the uh, one side of the thing here. There is a possibility that your new parts can go bad. It's very rare. I'm thinking more likely I disturbed something. I can get the tester on here. Nope. That's 47. Let's see what else I disturbed in here. I'm kind of leaning towards the uh, disturbance of something. Because you got to remember I was poking around in here. So we have to take a real close look as to what we did. Now this here. What is this? That's a point zero zero three three. That's where this guy was. Or am I misreading that? I like how one number is obliterated. Is it a three or is it a two? Well, point zero zero two three would be kind of weird. I don't really foresee that being. <coughs> Excuse me. That. Uh, and I remember the LCR meter said uh, 0 0.0333, that's three nanofarads there. And what about the one I put in here? That also goes to the oscillator. So let's compare. Three nanofarads. 4 nanofarads. So that's within 10%. Shouldn't complain too much about that. So I'm not sure what's going on here just yet. This here, 0.033, that's from the width control to ground, so this should be what, 33 nanofarads, measures 38, and let's check this. Three nanofarads, thirty-four. So 
why isn't the oscillator starting? Too low a frequency. Unless I disturbed something here on this coil, I don't think I did. Don't think I did. Hold it out real quick. Yeah, coil's not open. Second section isn't open. We'll go from the center. Yep. I didn't screw with that, so that's good. We already checked that. We checked that. We checked this guy. Uh, this is part of the vertical circuit, just for grins and giggles. The old one's 16 nanofarads. Let's test this one. Not sure this would have an effect on anything. 15 nanofarads, it's right on the mark. So yeah, I'm not sure what's going on there either. Something changed. Now it could be that for some strange reason the tube's bad. It was weird that it would go bad that quickly. You have this too. That's fairly secure. That was another .0 that was the 0 .015 at the lower voltage. Did I stick the other one? Or did it fall? There it is. So if we check this one. Did I read this backwards? I don't think I did. Why oh, is this one reading so different now? Interesting. What do you say it is? Now I don't think that this is part of the... It's not anywhere near the oscillator circuit and I don't think that the uh, difference in See, and that one measures uh, 0.017, which would be about right. Strange that the uh, fluke says differently. That says 0.017, but the uh, fluke, when I test it with the fluke, it's obviously quite a bit different. So, that's interesting. But... Uh, <clears throat> this is like syncing video, so I don't see how that would have any effect on the horizontal oscillator frequency. So, the next thing I'm going to do, because I checked my work, and my work looks good. Something ain't running. The uh, horizontal oscillator's not coming up to speed. Let's just double check and make sure that I didn't bump anything or cause anything to short out. Move stuff around here, make sure there's no contact with anything else. Doesn't appear to be. It could just be a dirty socket. It could be a tube that decided to go south. Really don't know yet. So what I am going to do is we're going to yank the tube out and um, then I'm going to see if the tube checks okay. And we'll clean the socket while we're at it. And then we'll give it a go again because you all saw it before, it was working. But now for some reason it decided not to. So here's our horizontal oscillator. It's a pretty firm socket, but that doesn't really mean anything. 6KD8. We've put a little tiny bit of deox in here. 
and then we'll work the tube in the socket a little bit, assuming that I can get that in there confidently without destroying the pins. All right, so we'll work this. Try not to bump into this yoke too much because that will kill things. So, let's uh, get the tube checker. All right. Zoom in a little bit here. Hard to tell, but... 6KD8. It's a uh, socket 6, plates at 68 and 52. Alright. So socket 6. Lighten up okay. No shorts. Socket's a little touchy. That's kind of sad on a mission. 68 and 52. It's about gone. Not getting any better either. So, and that's the mission's actually going down the longer it's on. So, uh, I think this oscillator tube spent. It kind of sort of worked the first time. So let's see if I can find a 6KD8. All right, so I got a 6U8, which is a good sub for a 6KD8. Let's go ahead and test the one I've got and see if it's meaningful. To uh, use this as a sub. Can't even tell if it's lighting up or not. There we go. Another one with a touchy socket. They're corroded pins. Yeah, it's coming around. Test better than the other one. Let's see, 52 and 68. Yeah, test better than the other one. It's what I've got on hand. I might have another one around here. It's another 6U8. Let's try this one. Let's see if this one is any better. Come on, wakey wakey. Got fuzzy pins on it? Yeah, it does. Alright, let's clean the pins off. I love crusty old tubes. Spray it down a little bit. Stick it in there. There we go. Now it's going to light. And we'll see how this one compares to the last one. No shorts. And this one kind of sucks. This is like the first one. Yeah, pretty much like the first one. Alright, so we'll ignore that. And we'll just double check that this one has a good reading again. And then we'll pop this in and see if our oscillator starts working. Yeah, this one's in much better shape. I've learned that with uh, horizontal oscillator tubes, it's got to be fairly strong to work correctly every time, but hey, I could be wrong on this one. So, let's get the TV back on the bench. Alright. 
So we're going to pop this in our socket and hook it all back up again and hope that it runs. This makes any kind of difference. Let's see if the oscillator starts. I hear vertical. There we go. Okay, well that's good. Still got a nice full raster too. I'm really amazed at uh, how bright this picture is. This safety glass needs to be cleaned terribly. Let's see, no red plating. That looks good. Let's get the uh, signal generator hooked up. I still have no sign of uh, channel 6, but the signal generator doesn't do squat, then we'll have to worry about what's going on with the tuner. Okay, we're on channel four. And we can see that uh, frequency is definitely off. Let's adjust our horizontal hold. There we go. It is at the extreme though. It's at the stop. And it does have a little bit of an issue with locking in. Picture's pretty sharp though. Pretty good looking. Geometry is pretty close. Got a little bit of stretch on the bottom. But shoot, not bad looking. Alright. So let's see if I can reach around here. That's your AGC. too bad. That's our height. Lots of overscan. Lots of overscan. Geometry still staying pretty true though. probably pretty good there so I think I need to reposition the stop on the horizontal uh, output tube I do get channel 6 but I'm concerned about the amount of uh, loss of sync there otherwise looks pretty good so we'll do some more tweaking and then uh, maybe we'll box this thing up. So far, so good. All right, so I changed the uh, stop on the horizontal output. And we're going to see if that uh, changes anything here. No, 
Gondola style power. There we go. Tubes are lightened. Got vertical. Alrighty. Whoop. Turn this on. Alright, so what I want to focus on now is dialing in that horizontal hold. Because, uh, well, as you may have noticed, the horizontal hold was kind of touchy. And on these, you can pull the uh, adjuster out a little bit and move it so that the stop point is different. But what I want to do is kind of adjust it so that it's a... Uh, Kind of in the middle middle point of its sink spot. You know, a lot of travel out of this one. Alright. Another thing you can do is drop it out of fine tuning. And then adjust the sink until the bars stand up like that. There's a little bit of phase lock, I think that's about right. And just pops right back in. And let's see what else we can do here. A little bit finer cross hatch. The focus on this thing's pretty good. Got a little bit of nonlinearity at the left, but that's not uncommon. A little bit of twitch on the uh, vertical there. Little tiny bit of hum, not much. Let's see here. Let's see if we've got any other little dot in the center. It's a little off center there. Pretty close though. Given the fact that the yoke is crumbling to nothing, I'm not really going to try to tweak the centering rings or anything like that. It's close enough. I think that if I try to do that, it's going to get yucky and crumble apart, and then I won't be able to do squat with it. Um, so far, it looks pretty nice. I think what I'm going to do next is clean it up a little bit more. We'll pull the safety glass on it and uh, clean up the cabinet a little bit, and we'll stick it on the converter box. And we'll see how it looks there. But right now, I'm liking the way it's looking. It's stable. So on this one, to clean behind the CRT, it's actually pretty easy. I think this just pops off. It's just pressed in there. Work it out without breaking it. Come on. Yeah, the bezel just comes off like that. And so here's your safety glass. And for the sake of being cautious, I'm just going to loosen these bottom ones. And then we'll take out the top one so we can tilt the glass out safely without it crashing into the floor and breaking. Because this is glass, it's not plastic. forward a little bit, lift out, and we can see all the lovely fuzz gumpies. I'm going to go set this glass down where I won't break it. And you can see it's utterly filthy. Alright, so shop towels and industrial grade Windex. Two shades lighter already.
Isn't that lovely? Phone's blowing up today. It's good to get this as clean as you possibly can because you will notice it when you put the uh, safety glass back on. There's still dirt there. This one's pretty filthy. It's not, uh, thankfully it's not nicotine residue. I hate that. And having grown up with a, a mother that smoked heavily and a family that smoked heavily, it's just not a pleasant smell. All right, so the next thing we have to deal with is the safety glass. And I think I'm gonna move this back a little bit so that I have a little more working room to show you what I need to do. Now I do need to clean behind the safety glass, but there's also a scratch. And you can see that scratch pretty well. It's pretty ugly. Well, what I'm gonna try to do is take some super fine polish and see if I can make that look a little better don't know how successful I'll be with that. Of course, that assumes that I can find the polish. All right. Well, first thing I'm going to do is try a little bit of Novus. Although it's not plastic, this is essentially just the same as wet sanding. And let's see if I can get the camera zoomed in on the area I'm going to be working. Yeah, that little scratch right there is you can see it it's pretty big you can definitely hear it when you run over it so I'm just gonna take the uh, Noah's number two and go to town on it for a little bit hopefully I can Clear it up and make it a little less crummy. Now, granted, this won't work for everything, but sometimes you get lucky and you can buff out a scratch in here. So I'm going to take a shop towel and work it in a little bit more. It's getting better. You can see it a whole hell of a lot less. I think, I think it was light enough that I'm not going to see it. Yeah, I actually buffed it out. That's good. So let me uh, get another paper towel and we'll clean this up. Yeah, we'll just clean this up with the uh, Windex now. Okay, nice and filthy. That's just on that side. It's probably worse on the other side. Let me uh, clean some of the solder flakes and debris off of here so I don't create another point to scratch. In fact, we'll lay this down here and get a new paper towel to work with just so I don't scratch the lens again. cleaned off. I can feel the crust on this one. This one's really dirty. About as bad as the screen was.
one silver on this again. This is the time to get this perfectly clean because streaks and things are going to show up when there's illumination from behind. Not bad. Can't see the scratch anymore. I'm happy about that. Now we'll very carefully set this back in here. And then we'll put the two retainers up top here. It'll catch. I don't want to tighten them all down just yet. I just want it to stay there. Now before you tighten all these down, you want to very carefully make sure that the glass is properly seated where it should be. Because if you don't, when you tighten these retainers down, they don't give very much and there's a good chance you'll crack the glass. So make sure it's centered in here, make sure it's where it should be. I'm adjusting this one right now because it's not quite where it needs to be. And then when you see there's equal distance around the edge of the glass and the frame, that's when you tighten these down. Like I said, if you don't, it'll crack. And then, uh, well, you'll be operating it without a safety glass, which is okay as long as you don't throw anything at it. We'll just go over this once again. Clean the extra dust out of there. And let's see if we can clean the bezel a little bit too. I'm sure that's dirty. a little bit nicer. I'm trying to remember if this has a key top or a bottom or anything like that. I don't think it does. I think it just goes on there. Got it apart. Might as well make it look as nice as possible. I know the cabinet's got some oxidation and rust on it, so I'm guessing that the bottom parts there were go on the bottom so you don't see them. And that just presses back in there. I might augment the pins with a little silicon sealer or something because plastics get old and they wear out and then this will probably try to pop out on you. Okay much better looking screen there. So the next thing I want to do is uh, hook a converter box up to it if we can. I don't remember if I still have a 300 home transformer here. I think it went home on another set. Yeah, anyways, I'll go look for that. We'll hook a converter box up to it and then see what our picture looks like now. Alright, so with the converter box hooked up, let's see uh, 
Let's see what we get here. Dudes are lighting. It's vertical. Raster. Pretty bright. Let's see if we can adjust our uh, contrast a little bit. So since these hearings started and since the questioning started, was her saying, listen, I'm not going to judge hypotheticals that are brought before me. She, she's basically making the argument, it wouldn't be prudent. Now the famous buzz comes from the detector. There is an adjustment for that back here. That's assuming I can get a clear enough signal long enough to adjust it. I guess that just is what it is. The little bit of noise in the picture is due to the fact that I'm not using any shielded cable. We definitely have an overloading issue. The manganese cap. Very true. With which we have been hoping to sign a trade agreement. You're very knowledgeable. Donald works for Newsview Magazine. Of course, every day there's some... Trying to find a really bright picture again. There we go. Let's adjust the NGC a little bit. Back it off until it quits twitching. And then we need to readjust our video, our contrast, because uh, turning down the AGC affects the video amplification. It's got plenty of brightness, that's for sure. Very strong CRT. Let's see if we can uh, adjust the size a little bit. Depend. The only thing stronger than us and is. And I'll have to adjust the vertical. Let's hide the attic. No, in the basement. Why can't we just get in the running car? Are you crazy? Let's hide behind the chainsaws. Yeah. Yeah, okay. If you're in a horror movie, you a little make bit more size. That's what you do. If you want to save 15% or more on car insurance, you switch to Geico. It's what you do. So far, so good. Meet a lynx in the wild and your cat. For a lynx, this need is It's got a nice picture. provides for your cat. They decide count. I got to stay away from PBS because Curious George will trigger a content ID. And we'll walk you through your options. Answer any questions you have, and help you enroll over the. And with the AGC turned down a little bit, you don't have as much buzz. So that's good. They live there. Más o menos son 250 grados. for you, Jason. First. Nice sharp picture. There's a lot of. Assuming I get reception, which you don't really hear. Okay. Why you feel that way? What has happened? Around twelve thousand to the classroom. I love ten uh, percent. This useless digital system that we have that doesn't really pick up anything around here. And it will not tolerate multipath at all. To bring back in person classes for middle and high school students. Last month, the district extended distance learning until January. A school board meeting is scheduled for this evening. We're definitely wanting everyone to feel that whatever safety protocol they're coming up with that's within the guidelines, they're comfortable with that. And if not. But you see, a girl can't judge if a girl is sexy. Only men can. 
like me. I'm the king of quality. Oh, you know, this is, this is really a, a kind of an honor, too. Yeah, well, sure, sure. It's not every duchess that has a chance to become a princess, even if it is only for one night. Oh, no, I'm so excited. Of the Senate, if they all are present whenever that final... Unique. Look, I've been working in prisons for almost 20 years. All right, well, that's about enough of that. Anyways, so this thing's working happy again. It's all cleaned up. Turned out pretty nice, I think. So uh, with that, thanks for watching the video, guys. More stuff to come soon.